Hello, dear friends at Asia Society. I am the artistic director of the Beijing Music Festival, Shuangzhou. It's a pleasure to share with you the history of the last 25 years of the Beijing Music Festival, to cherish the memories of music celebrations at the BMF, and to exchange across borders with music once again. I want to send huge thanks to the Asia Society for this great opportunity. We will continue our mission and promise to welcome you back at our festival and to let music once again connecting us all. Look forward to seeing you all soon. Till then. Good evening. Uh, so 12 years ago, I was visiting Beijing and I got a call from the uh, Great Wall String Quartet and asking if you would write a uh, a new quartet for their concert tour and their debut album also titled The Great Wall. So the theme was The Great Wall Plays The Great Wall. So um, right after I hand off the phone, I was in Beijing. So I took a cab straight to The Great Wall and it was there. I heard a fascinating, inspiring performance um, at a local museum and the performance was on the stone chimes of Asian China. And I was just fascinated by this unique, not so well-tempered sound. And in my second string quartet, I attempted to um, pick up those uh, overtones and reconnect them into new melodies. And it starts on the cello solo and it slowly expanded um, to the whole ensemble. And that forms the first movement of the quartet called A Song from the Lost Time. The second movement is called Toccata. And here is much more playful and rhythmic. And um, you will hear unconventional techniques utilized here to imitate uh, the sound of Gu Qing, uh, an Asian Chinese instrument with um, the plucked strings. I hope you enjoy. Thank you very much.
congratulations on the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Music Festival. Congratulations on 25th anniversary. Happy 25th anniversary, BMF. Happy 25th anniversary to Beijing Music Festival. Congratulations on the 25th year anniversary. I want to wish you many happy returns on the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Music Festival. I want to congratulate the Beijing Music Festival on their 25th anniversary. I want to congratulate the Beijing Music Festival with their 25th anniversary. 25 years of the Beijing Music Festival. This is something to celebrate throughout the music world. Celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Music Festival. I wish I could be in Beijing with you guys, but I wish you all the best for this 25th anniversary. Ni hao, I would like to congratulate the Beijing Music Festival to their 25th anniversary. Send my best wishes to the 25th anniversary of the Beijing International Music Festival. The celebration year of the 25th Beijing Music Festival. 谢谢。献上我对北京国际音乐节二十五周岁生日的祝福。There is great hope that classical music in China will keep developing. Congratulations, 25th anniversary of Beijing Music Festival. 北京国际音乐节二十五周年华诞，仅送上我诚挚的祝福。As I was、uh, looking through, trying to prepare、uh, some talks this evening and, and thinking about who to invite,、uh, we were looking at this, and I realized that this is probably the oldest relationship. I mean, that with the the Beijing Music Festival that I have with any institution musically in Asia at this point.、Uh, it's ongoing for 25 years. My first time going there was in in 2001,、uh, in October 2001,、uh, to be precise. And if you remember something about that period in history, that happened to be a, just a few weeks after a, a very unfortunate incident here in New York with 911, which shut down pretty much travel for weeks.、Uh, that seems like、uh, child's play now, but back then it was a very big deal. And when、uh, my first time in, in at the Beijing Music Festival,、um, my first weekend there included the. China premiere of Nabucco, done by the Polish National Opera. The next night was the orchestra and chorus of the Polish National Opera doing the Mahler Second Symphony, conducted by Penderecki, Krzysztof Penderecki. And the next night happened to be the world premiere of a cello concerto by Philip Glass, by the China Philharmonic, and I think its first or second appearance as the house band, the new house band of of the York of the festival, and it. It's kind of hard to top that anywhere in the world as as a one weekend of offerings. The next weekend,、uh, I flew back, and it also happened to be Tan Dun's first appearance in China professionally since winning the Oscar. And the sad thing about all of this is that when I was trying to find my reviews, a, a good number of the people that I wrote for back then are no longer in existence. The websites are gone. The magazines are no longer there, and yet the Beijing Music Festival is still going at 25. So this is,、uh, I think,、uh, something really to be、uh, to, to to sort of honor and cherish in a way. Looking back, one of the things that was amazing as I was going back here was how much a bit of history this seems. It was a very different time for America, for China, for the world, and. We want to talk a little bit about that this evening. Just、uh, for for several people here, this is they've had not just one but multiple、um, appearances at the Beijing Music Festival, and that gives a, a, a an opportunity to really think about how the festival and, and and talk about how that festival has evolved and how the world changed in between. Now, the person here who has been at the festival even longer than me is Jamie Bernstein. Sitting at the other end. Now she was there the year before, and I now have to say to to my wife's chagrin, I have a lot of concert programs at home that I still have of significant events that I've seen that I think are really important. I found also programs that、um, I didn't attend, which is kind of annoying. Until we get to a place where I found the program from the year that Jamie was there. Which which concert was it? I did more than one. The first concert, and I and we were discussing earlier how COVID has has ruined our memory. So let me just refresh your memory. This is the program book 
from 2000, we turn to, ah, here we go, a concert in commemoration of the 10th anniversary of the death of Leonard Bernstein. Narrator, Jamie Bernstein, China National Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Michael Barrett. Selections from Candide, Wonderful Town, Peter Pan, On the Town, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, and uh, West Side Story. And the next night, and this was at the Forbidden City Concert Hall, the next night was, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, the first one was at the Poly Theater. The second night at the Forbidden City Concert Hall was a children's event called the Bernstein Beat, which you've done many times for many different audiences. However, I wish to point out, it was not at night. It was a children's concert, after all. So it was in the afternoon. OK, yeah, oh, 2 PM. Sorry. Yes, I didn't get that far. Well, I want to know a couple of things regarding this. I mean, looking at how this came about and, and what the festival was like at, at, in those very early stages, how did that event occur? How did they come to you? How, how did this come about? Well, it was a rather circuitous route, actually. Uh, my, my involvement with uh, the Beijing Music Festival happened through a college classmate of mine whom I reconnected with at a reunion that we'd had like the year before, Kathy Barbash. And Kathy Barbash was so instrumental, no pun intended, in bringing uh, Asian and Western cultures together. And she was uh, very much involved in creating, in, in launching the, Be the Beijing Music Festival. She worked with Long Yu and helped create their, you know, the, 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 the whole, uh, you know, a mission statement. So Kathy Barbash uh, was also very involved in uh, bringing artists to the festival, and I was one of the people that she approached. So that was how it all happened, was through Kathy Barbash. Now, was this a program that was, was pre-existing and you just fit to that audience, or was this something that you made especially for them? Well, my children's concert, the Bernstein Beat, which is all about rhythm using my father's music, uh, that already existed. And I had done that concert a few times already and would subsequently do it many, many times all over the world. The other concert we designed specially for the festival, and we brought uh, singers with us to work with the China National Symphony. Now, this was a long time ago. This, uh, this was, all, this was uh, 2000. And in those days, the orchestra had played very little 20th century uh, American music. Maybe a little Gershwin, that might have been it. So they were uh, very challenged by the Bernstein music that they had to prepare for this concert. And I remember uh, that the rehearsals were very difficult and the, the language uh, differential was another element that made everything exponentially more challenging. And so uh, I remember that for the West Side Story excerpts, the, the percussion was so difficult for them and they had to have many what we call percussion discussions where they had, you know, okay, you play the bongos and I'm going to be over here playing the timbales and then when, when, that, when the maracas come in, you have to run over there and this is all, you really have to map it out. And, and this was something new for that percussion section. So there was, there was a lot of percussion discussion. So I was thinking about the incredible difference between what that orchestra was going through in 2000 compared to 18 years later when they performed a uh, West Side Story film with live orchestra, when you know not only were they performing the score to West Side Story, but they were also performing it in sync with the screening of the film. And they were able to do this with complete aplomb and mastery. And I, I realized how far this orchestra had come in 18 years. Well, we should point out that was a different orchestra. You, you well, there is the that, but the whole sensibility in, in Beijing by then had yeah. changed so much. It's true, it wasn't the, the same 
uh, players. Yeah. I mean, by the next year, the China Philharmonic, uh, I mean, the first time I heard them was in the Philip Glass Concerto, and they actually counted better than the soloist, who was, who was British. So that, that was a big, a big step up. Um, but but I, I was also there for the, uh, the West Side Story performance, and I, I thought it was remarkable. Be it was fantastic. Not just because of the Bernstein beat, I mean, not just about the beats, but about what went on in between. I mean, they were really able to carry a, a, a huge stylistic range in terms of the, the American jazz versus the, the Latin sounds. And it was quite impressive, it, con considering that the conductor was also Chinese. The conductor was Chinese, but um, everybody was getting the message in a completely multilingual, international way. Well, well looking back at those, those original um, performances that you did in Beijing, now, you talked about a little bit with the instrumentalists and getting them up to speed. What was the audience like? Did you tailor yourself differently to that audience? Uh, and how did they respond? Um, I didn't really tailor myself differently. I'm, I just do what I do, and I talk the way I talk, and, and it doesn't matter where the audience is from or how old they are. I feel like I'm basically just me, and I hope I'm getting across, and I don't make adjustments. However, of course, I was not able to speak in Mandarin at all. And so there was a translator, and, and it was uh, difficult because I would, do a, I would say a few sentences, and then I would let the translator translate those sentences. So, you know, that added a lot of time to the concert, and it made me very conscious of keeping my energy up because everything took longer th than it would ordinarily. So I've, I felt this responsibility to keep everybody attentive and keep things moving. Yeah. Well, during that period, there was a remarkable increase in the sophistication of the Chinese audiences. I mean, they really understood a lot of things. And I dare say it wasn't just uh, live performances. It was access to that kind of music and uh, you know, legally available internationally or otherwise. Uh, they were able to find all sorts of things. And if you knew where to look, you could find anything. You could find your father's young people's concerts. You could find uh, you know, DVD pirate copies of, of The Unanswered Question for people who were ready to brave that. And so, so this became a very known entity around China. And for even grown-ups who were learning about this music, the Young People's Concert was a huge, uh, had a huge audience there. I mean, did you yourself notice a difference in sort of the understanding of Bernstein, of that, that the resonance of that name when you came back uh, I did later? notice quite a difference. There, there was more a sense of introducing Bernstein back in 2000, whereas by 2018, everyone seemed to have a good sense of who Leonard Bernstein was and what his music was, and, and it was much more of a known quantity by then. Yeah. Also, uh, the last time you were there, I think your, your book, uh, Famous Father Girl, had come out in English, and you were talking about that. Did, did, what kind of comments did you get from, from uh, journalists, and what, what kind of questions did they ask you? Oh, they asked so many questions. They were curious about the book because they already knew who my father was. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been interested at all. But I had the sense that they, were, they very much knew who Leonard Bernstein was and, and what his legacy was for the world. And so that made them extremely curious to know more about him as a private person and a father and a husband and, and what his personal life was like. And that's uh, what people can read about in my book. Yeah. Now, I mean, one last question really about the, the educational component of this festival, which was really in place more or less from the beginning. Um, how did you think that, how was that handled uh, from, from your end as opposed to other kind of environments that you've dealt with? Right. Well, my father was a compulsive teacher. Everything he did really was a kind of teaching, whether he was conducting an orchestra or telling a good joke or quoting from Shakespeare or, or just, you know, talking at the dinner table. There was this same sense of him tugging you on the sleeve to say, listen to this, I have to share this with you. And he was like that about music. He was like that about everything. And um, I think that my brother and sister and I all somewhat inherited this, this urge to share and teach. So I was completely thrilled and gratified that 
that I myself was able to uh, bring my father's educational sensibility to the Beijing Music Festival and that they were so open to that, that it was very much a part of the festival's own DNA, was, was this urge to, to share education. And uh, it, that's why the, the children's concert that I did was so particularly fun and that the kids were so attentive. I was amazed at how attentive they were. And there, in a nice little footnote to that concert, uh, it was partially sponsored by McDonald's. <laughs> and so all the kids had these little McDonald's flags, and I just thought that was so adorable. It was a real worlds in braiding together in, in the best possible way, especially since one of the ways that I had to explain complicated rhythms, no matter how complicated a rhythm is, you can always break it down into groups of three beats and two beats. And I called the two beat bundle hot dog. And I called the three beat bundle hamburger. So it was so perfect that, that McDonald's was sponsoring that concert. But in, but in, in China, they pronounced it hambobo. <laughs> Okay, so to go from, from that, we, we go to one of the more memorable events that I, re that I can recall from the festival, which is Madame Whitesnake. And we have our composer here, Joe Long. Um, one of the things that, um, I don't think I ever shared this with you, but this is a bit of history. Um, I had a, a, a discussion, in fact, my only lengthy discussion with Joe Wincheng, uh, your, the professor and your mentor and uh, the man responsible for bringing basically a whole generation of Chinese composers to Columbia University, um, he, was, he felt very sad for your generation because you would never find an audience. And he was quite serious. He said, well, they're never going to be accepted as American and they will, they're not Chinese anymore because they've been out and the Chinese people will never understand them once they've been abroad. Now, keep in mind, this was in the 1990s. And historically, it's probably not as, as much of a miscalculation as uh, Thomas Malthus saying that the world will run out of food 200 years ago. But it, it's wrong for some of the same reasons, which is things happened that no one could foresee. Tandon won an Oscar. Uh, American music went in a way that not only, it wasn't, you didn't just have to reference the modern tradition, you were expected and encouraged to bring other things to it, your, your own personal background. So you were expected to bring maybe jazz or rock or tango or klezmer or Peking opera to your composition, depending on what your own background was. And also it didn't gauge China and how fast that audience would become musically sophisticated. So, you know, early in the days of, of that, I, I saw Tan Dun's music, in, uh, an evening of Tan Dun's music in Beijing. I saw an evening of Guo Wenjing's operas. I saw Chen Shigong, who apparently had his first um, featured concert there in, in China since leaving. What was it like back then as a, as a composer to have your music done in China? I mean, were there, in, were there any organizations or other people other than the BMF who were bringing music from Chinese living abroad? Well, I, I came to the States uh, in 1985 to attend the Columbia University. Um, I find uh, a little confused because uh, my original works is very based on the Chinese elements. And uh, mostly our education were written in mostly tonal music. At Columbia, uh, what, what, what you mentioned, uh, what Professor Zhou commented on us, I never heard about it. But I, I think you know, Professor Zhou hoped us to still keep the traditional and the ancient China culture. That's what his uh, uh, mission, you know, to hope us. Uh, because our education, you know, our teachers, most of them are trained from Russia. Uh, and even you know, we study the harmony system is sobbing. It's not really American uh, the tradition. Uh, at Columbia, uh, we call this mostly second way in our school. 
or close to that, but not, not, not anymore. Uh, so I got confused, but I thought that, you know, that's good experience, you know, for me to explore more atonality and uh, to break what, what you know, my original voices. And uh, eventually, we can't really get rid of it because that, that culture is really in your blood. Um, so, you know, talking about the, we, what the relationship with the uh, Beijing Music Festival, uh, I watched them, but uh, you know, I joined them in, in probably in the 2007 when I finished uh, Columbia and uh, lived in New York mostly. You know, I stayed in Brooklyn for 13 years. Uh, work a lot of different. Uh, groups with the dance company, you know, freelancing composer. Uh, of course, the people, uh, you know, some people already went back to China, like Ye Xiaogang graduated and went back to China, and uh, we chose to stay here. Um, but uh, of course, we, we, we hope our work, you know, to be performed both in the West and China. So I got the opportunity to meet Mr. Yulong, Master Yulong, uh, he said, what are, you do, what are you doing now? I said, I'm planning to write in an opera. So, oh, that's exciting. You know, what opera? But the White Snake. So, uh, he, he shot his support immediately. And uh, he said, uh, I will co commission the work and co produce with Opera Boston. So, that become a the first American opera company to collaborate with a major Chinese uh, culture organization. Uh, this was very excited, uh, uh, you know, for this project. We both premiered it in 2010 in Boston, and in the same year, October, at the Be uh, Beijing Music Festival, gave the Asian premiere. And uh, of course, you know, also asked me to write uh, another piece, like oh, Nine Oats. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, also a major commission. It's a whole evening uh, piece. Uh, the text of Bai Chu Yuan is a, a, a great uh, ancient uh, poet, um, 75 minutes long, all, uh, all 11 stanzas, 11 movements. Uh, so actually, the piece is. Uh, conceived by Yulong. Yulong is a very innovative artist. You know, always think about, oh, this composer, you know, he's a very, you know, um, supported this young composer like Du Yuan and, uh, and Zhou Tian. Uh, and always have the new ideas, you know. He said, uh, I want nine oats on the stage, but I don't want a choir. I don't want a choir, you know, they can't travel. So you could have uh, voices, you know, like soprano, tenor, uh, auto and bass with a full orchestra. Uh, but I said, you know, we have to wait. You know, I'm working on the opera. And so that's why the, the Nine Oats was premiered in 2013 uh, after the, the opera premiered. Yeah. Well, let's, well, let's go, go back, back to the, to the opera. opera. That was, that was performed, performed first, of first of all in Boston, Boston as, you said, as you said, and then, yeah, then in then China. China. What, was what was the difference, the difference between hearing, hearing uh, a Western, a Western orchestra, orchestra and, 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 a, and a Chinese, Chinese orchestra, orchestra perform that piece. Chinese orchestra, you're talking about the Peking Opera? Or yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, uh, in the modern medicine, uh, we first have uh, some idea to bring, you know, to borrow some uh, mm -hmm. Peking Opera directly, yeah, yeah. like uh, other, some other Chinese opera also already did. You know, like we, can, we can't do that anymore. So. But I also have an idea to bring in a nandan. Uh, that means uh, the male soprano, mm -hmm. the real high voices. But uh, you know, we decided to set the whole opera in English, not not combined. Right. Some Chinese opera combine English or Chinese or Chinese, but this one, everything is Chinese uh, English. Mm -hmm. So we can use the nandan. You know. My English is not perfect, but but in Nandan they have to spend years uh, to sing uh, to sing in English on stage. So then we decided to uh, use a, a real 
เมลสปานอแล้วก็ไมเคิลเมนยาชิอย่าอสจอชิงอย่าที่สารัตว่าชนิดอะไรมันจะเป็นยูสแต่ not directly quotation um, I would say I have to really compromise you know for for me it's the first opera mm -hmm. so I want to I'm ambitious to to make the opera you know often guard uh, but uh, the librettist and uh, and then the opera company they said Zhou Long yeah you know you can write you know what you want but uh, we want an opera uh, can can be singing <laughs> yeah, the audience can you know, hear the melody that's opera so I said, okay so then I, I borrowed some uh, material and uh, but uh, explore some kind of a speech singing like a, like a, uh, yes, yeah um, like a, almost like a tough tone mm -hmm. but the uh, setting in the in the uh, intonation into the, the peak opera is setting chinese sprechstimme oh, yes yeah. that's right yeah. <laughs> Uh, and and I, also, I also remember your your orchestra writing being much more adventurous than the vocal writing, which was much more lyrical and and you know traditionally operatic. Uh, I would say the, uh, uh, most of my orchestral work are also, you know, accessible, more accessible. But the chamber chamber music writing is very different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think doing also have I heard uh, her some pieces very, you know, a tonality at Harvard that but it totally. She changed the style. <laughs> <You know>. uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> so what? So so, uh, tell me about the audiences because um, uh, you're dealing with with one audience in America, which certainly knows opera, but they may not know the story, mm. and in China, where they know the story, but they may not know what a 20th century opera sounds like. How would the audience reactions different? In Boston, uh, at the premiere, they have uh, one pre reel. Uh, that means the donors all come, you know, you know pay thousand dollars a ticket for table and uh, come to the first uh, preview, and the three uh, concerts, uh, all four halls, all four halls. So they they were there waiting for this. You know, in the forty, uh, I think in the forty years, uh, Opera Boston never commissioned a, a new opera. That's the first time they commissioned an opera, and it's the first time for. You know, as we mentioned, you know, the Beijing, Beijing Music Festival collaborated with Opera Boston. Mm -hmm. And also, first time to use uh, American singers, you know, most, uh, most often American singers, to sing in uh, Chinese opera. Yeah. Yeah. In English? In English. And the audiences love it. You know, mm -hmm. they have uh, more than 10 minutes, uh, you know, Standing ovation. Yeah. How, yeah. How, what, yeah. What about China? Because of, in China, and they don't they don't get much opera in English. For one. Yeah. In China, they first they, they can't really listen to the English. Uh, even we have the subtitle in Chinese, and also because the Madame Etienne is already pressed in the different uh, uh, media like a uh, big opera, strong opera, uh, lots of films. Series. Yeah, television show and the movie. They're familiar with the story, and they're familiar with the with custom. But uh, you can see you know, some picture. We don't have video here. It's a it's a custom. It's a very minimalism. You know, mm -hmm. like uh, you know the the director is uh, working with uh, Philip Glass, so he is doing the very minimalism staging. Mm -hmm. The I doing the inter intermission in Beijing. I smoke a pipe outside of the concert hall. There's a taxi driver attend the concert. So, so, Tell so us what what is this? This <laughs> this kind of <laughs> can they, they can really take it? Yeah, yeah. Well, the next piece that you did was actually in Chinese, as you said, the nine odes. Nine odes is uh, totally in Chinese. Yes. Yeah, yeah. What was the reaction to that? How did that differ from White Snake? Uh, that there's you know challenge for me as a composer and yeah. also for the audience and even for the singers mm -hmm. because the Xu uh, Yuan's Chinese is ancient Chinese. Yeah. yeah. You know why some lines I have to get the processed, you know the meaning. I read Chinese books and even the English translation, mm -hmm. combine them to understand what each characters. Mm -hmm. uh, you know sometimes for the singers they have to really search the certain character they they don't know. Yeah. yeah. It's a challenge. So it didn't help the audience that it was in Chinese. Not really, this is ancient <laughs> Chinese book. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, but it, interesting though that the 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 combination of those two pieces, 
uh, they are very different. I mean, they're, they're sort of on, on, on extremes. Do you imagine any other organization that would have commissioned those pieces? I'm not, I don't know. Any other organization? Yeah, I mean, other than the Beijing Music Festival, it seems like a very, very specific type of thing. For the Manang Oats? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, if, if the Western, like uh, if an American organization comes in, I, I probably choose to have an English translation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Citing in, Chinese, in English yeah. or, or yeah. French. In French, uh, premiere this piece, I maybe choose a French. I don't know, I can yeah. in the, the French. <laughs> I know, it's a hypothetical situation. No, no one commissioned it other than the BMF, so. Uh, <laughs> it, but uh, Madame Whitesnake is coming back. I mean, first of all, it had a, a second uh, production in Boston, but it has a third production, I think we can sort of talk about that it's coming up rather than, uh, I don't think we have specific dates we can announce yet, but but the BMF is involved in bringing it back again. Yeah, I, I think, I, I guess so, yeah, because uh, they planned that this past mm -hmm. June in Paris mm -hmm. uh, was canceled yeah, yeah. because of the pandemic. Um, I really hope the pandemic will pass. You know, we have everything in life. Yes, yeah. but but this this will still be in English, yes, the opera? In English, Okay. Yes. Okay. Have a different uh, casting. Mm -hmm. Probably they will have French uh, subtitle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a new director. Yeah. Entirely new show. I'm except for the for it, except yeah. for the music. What? what? Except for the music, a, an entirely new show. Well, good. Well, we, we look forward to that, and we, it's uh, the Opera Comique. It will be, far away. <laughs> <laughs> the Opera the Opera Comique is doing the premiere. Is the performance? Is that correct? Opera Boston. No, no, no. It uh, of, of this production. This product I have in, in Paris or no? They they produced the staging already, but they just canceled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Well, moving on to our second Pulitzer Prize winner on the stage, we have Du Yun. And you you are a bit younger than the rest of us, I have to say. My feet doesn't even. Yes, exactly, exactly. So in terms of uh, actually getting to this, I, you were you were probably young when the Beijing Music Festival first started. So four, five. <laughs> no, I actually I, I already came to um, college in uh, to Oberlin. So, what what was the buzz like about the music festival at that point? What do you remember hearing about it? I do not know. What, I was a very diligent student. Ah, uh, you know, locked what, myself in the practice room. What was the first thing that you remember about the BMF? What what was the the first resonance? Madame Butterfly. No, Bicep. No. <laughs> White Snake. Oh. I need to warm up in speaking. Um, uh, uh, by, by what is that? The name of your piece? Madam White Snake. Madam White Snake. No, no, no. <laughs> it was your work. Actually, it made me. Uh, 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 yes, I'm. I'm very. I'm a bumpkin. I don't know. I don't know things. Well, okay. Madam White Snake was a Chinese story. Uh, Angel's Bone was not really a Chinese story, so audiences didn't really have that to, to, to latch on to. It was an entirely new piece and a very different uh, musical world and a very different story. How, can you talk a little bit about how this piece came about, how it went to China? It was in Hong Kong first, because I, I saw it in Hong Kong, but how did it uh, make the journey onto China? Yeah, before we go there, I, I wanted to actually um, say something that you mentioned about Zhou Wenzhong's that line, which actually touched me quite a bit. Um, um, I think that really, I just want to first say that um, uh, there are, um, actually there will be a new album that is tribute to Zhou Wenzhong by like really, really underground electronic musicians in China. And this is something like I'm also part of that initiative as well. So, so the idea is to breaking um, the the, the so-called avant-garde, and and really looking at uh, Zhou Wenzhong as this model of who really brought um, this 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 thinking, you know. And then uh, because there are so many like hip hop artists, right? Like hip hop uh, artists who would pay tribute to Zhangis or Bjork would talk greatly about Boulez and, 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 and Zanakis. And I was like, why can't 
the 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 subculture artists um, in China who are not classical music are paying tribute to Zhou Wenzhong, right? So it's not about about um, who doesn't understand anymore. Of, I feel like that's the young generation's um, spirit. So I think that is also, I am going back to Beijing Music Festival, and I think that is why also uh, Angel's Bone could have an audience at the festival, because I, you know, not a lot of people um, told me that um, they had like language barriers. They thought they saw a film. <laughs> Well, it, it was a very different audience, even from 2010, 2000, you know, d until until uh, you were there in 19, yeah? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And so there was a certain edginess, and Beijing has a certain edge to it in terms of, of its avant-garde audience. But that brings another question, you know, is there a Beijing Music Festival audience, or is is there a an, an audience in Beijing that likes adventurous music and they'll come to hear adventurous music? or they like classical music, so they'll come hear the Mahler Chamber Orchestra, or they like opera, so they'll come see the Ring Cycle. Are they separate audiences, or is it one festival audience? Did you get a, an, a you, you were there in uh, doing another performance of your own pieces, uh, solo work. Did you get a sense that that was the same audience, or no? Um, I think having a festival is about building a trust with your audience. And it's not overnight. It's literally, when we're looking at the edition of each editions, you see the trajectory of not just the festivals, but reflection of our time and, and the country, really. And, and, and if that trust is built, and people will come back because we wanted to explore, we want to see, we wanted to reflect. And that I, have, I, I do also want to commend uh, Zhou Shang. You know, that I don't really know her before uh, my production going there. And she would actually stay up all night and and really go into like details, details, worry about details um, for before each production opens. And that kind of like diligence and that kind of uh, dedication, wanting to bring in, you know, new voices, wanting to bridge and wanting to look at new possibilities. And I think that is the power of the performing arts. Yeah. Was there a big difference in the kind of audience you saw there and, and, and coming back than you remember when you were living in China? Yeah, um, I remember Zhou Shang was, was, you know, we were both very worried about Andrew's bone for obvious reasons. Um, but then later she, she told me that um, it's one of the uh, most searched um, thing uh, during the in, festival. Internet. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And, and I will say that we don't have a lot of musical examples tonight, but uh, all of these things are findable on YouTube. So if you want to get a trailer for e either of these operas, please, by all means, search those out. Uh, and they're both actually, for different reasons, riveting pieces. And uh, I, I can't recommend them highly enough. Um, I think that now um, we have someone in Beijing who's been waiting very patiently. Uh, can we bring uh, Zhou Suang to the screen. Hello. Ah, we there you are. Nice Almost. to see you all. There we go. So nice to see you. It's very early for you. It's um it's very early, but all the excitement made me wake up early too. Well, as, as the second Okay, I'll just keep talking because I know you can hear me. Uh, as the second artistic director of the festival, Please, you know, share with us a little bit about your coming here. I mean, I know that your professional life has been uh, more in stage and screen uh, and, and drama, uh, um, you know, of, of a spoken variety. Uh, but you, music was very much a part of your life growing up. So can you tell me how you, you're bringing your professional and personal experience to, to the festival now? Well, music has always been part of my, my life. I uh, grew up in a musical family and I had early education of music and it continued to be my DNA. So when I came across Beijing Music Festival, when I was actually still in Beijing before I went to the UK, uh, participating in a lot of live concerts with my father, as well as operas that the festival brought in, um, so I was part of the younger generation audience earlier uh, for the city. And the um, feeling was that it's, it's one place to feel international uh, in my hometown. Um, and then we moved on uh, to 
reconnect with the festival by bringing uh, a children's production, Noah's Flood, from Northern Ireland uh, opera all the way to China to the Beijing Music Festival. And uh, that that experience it really brought me to recognize Beijing Music Festival professionally uh, with its history in creating a um, stage for uh, fresh new productions and young musicians and as well as music education. So um, I was very touched because there, there seemed to be no boundary and highly collaborative and such amazing freedom in Beijing Music Festival stage in expressing in opera. And it was also at a site specific venue. So that uh, had a spark in me. And then a few years later, I met Maestro Longyu in London, BB, um, the BBC Proms. And then he talked to me in depth about his personal vision in music and how music could share with the international audience and how his personal goal is to continue the Beijing Music Festival with fresh new blood. So at that time, I already started to fantasize about what the festival might be like. And then a few years later, after I joined the Beijing Music Festival as associate uh, um, program director, worked with the team on the ground for a couple of opera direct, uh, productions, uh, I realized um, I became part of the team and uh, I was very happy to, to be there to, to just work as a program director. And it really came to my surprise and my great encouragement uh, led by Maestro Longyu to, to basically say, here we go, you know, continue my legacy and doing more. And your mission is to, to do it differently and do it more. So well, no, no pressure. Um, no pressure. Yes, I was, uh, I was, I said exactly the same thing. No pressure. Um, he told me about this in New York. I was very surprised. I said, wow, what have you got in mind? And he said, uh, I'm, I'm waiting for you. What have you got in mind? So then, like what Du Yun just uh, said, I, you know, I reviewed all the past uh, great moments of the festival, the, all the opera productions, all, all the profound memories and events. And then I, I started to bring out some outrageous uh, <laughs> ideas to, uh, to Long. And uh, he said, amazing, do it. So, so he's always this person who, who kind of lead us, but also just silently support us in every single aspect. I, I would like to say, like, looking back, the first few things I did at the festival, I think it, it was, it, he was just watching quietly in the corner and, and, and then he, he was so in, inspired by us as well as just in, you know, continually supporting all of the young people. And that really made me stay on and, uh, you know, gave, gave him my promise to, to bring the festival further. And uh, he always, you know, he always shared something in common with a lot of um, young musicians and, and also established musicians is to connecting not only China to the world, but to make the festival a, a ongoing uh, context to for people, international artists to gather in, in this short space of time in Beijing and to create more and to share more and to bring new vision. And I think this is, this is what we have achieved in the past and it will be continue uh, uh, vision for us to to do more. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that you really have brought to the festival is uh, uh, small scale and, and very immersive uh, theatrical dramatic productions, particularly of opera, sometimes of, of repertory opera, uh, the Cunning Little Vixen, which turned into a nice uh, stage piece called Vixen, which uh, was was reduced and, and, and uh, with a smaller band and very much in your face in terms of audience, but also new operas that um, very much put the, the audience right there in the center. Um, that is not exactly, uh, uh, you know, compatible with, with social distancing these days, but it was a very good run. And I, I'm curious, is, is that something that you did because that was your own personal strength, because that was something you had, you had done in the West? Or is it something that you thought China really needed to be brought up to speed with? in terms of, of what was going on in the rest of the world? Yeah, I, I was like together, uh, like doing and Jyoti and we, our generation, I think we, we went abroad quite early and we grew up with the context of the Western 
uh, art development and uh, live performance art development. So I was very aware of what what was going on in the uh, worldly city like London and New York and Berlin. Um, what was happening in the opera scene and the op uh, music, new music scene. And this form of uh, exploring a, this experience of, uh, as an audience to go into different kind of music experiences rather than just tie yourself up in, in a kind of classical ritual. I think this was something that was emerging when I started at the Beijing Music Festival as associate uh, uh, program director. So my idea was not to bring China some new things, but to make China be a new uh, workshop for international artists like uh, of my generation to create something together up to the beat with the rest of the world. So um, that context we want to uh, create uh, in time, in tune with the world uh, in terms of doing new work and bring, bringing new ways of presenting music to the, to the expanding audience uh, became my kind of um, uh, agenda uh, to start at the festival. And, it, and it, went, it went really well because we had new audience. We had audience uh, that, that uh, perhaps always came to the Beijing Music Festival, but quite a lot of audience, you know, they, they, they started, you know, possibly these operas were their first operas and <laughs> their first opera experience was quite different from the traditional festival opera uh, experience, uh, audience. So, uh, so, so that we achieved. In, in working together. So co-production as well uh, has, has gone to a different uh, sphere because a different kind of ex ex exploration because we don't need to spend that much money and we can, we can make, make an opera um, a true uh, immersive experience and very much uh, toned down to small scale productions. Uh, so more repertoire and more composer uh, new work can be achieved in our festival, rather than just everything is grand, grandiose and big. And I think that's parallel to what we do as the, as the DNA of the festival, bring the China new concept and, um, and, and making uh, these um, cultures meet through music. And, and that's just opened up another semi, you know, uh, semi platform. I think it worked very well and uh, it, it will be continued at our festival as well. Yeah. Well, this has not been the, the, the greatest three years uh, for any kind of festival in the world. And yet you still manage to keep going in some format in whatever way possible. Can you tell us just how that worked for you? Um, I mean, we, we have uh, done our own thing over here, but tell us how uh, Beijing kept going in the past uh, in the COVID years. How did the festival go in? How do you utilize technology? Um, how did you use your online platform? Just kind of brief us on what's been going on. I think uh, before the uh, pandemic hit, we already started to looking at, you know, technology advancement and we had uh, foreign artists and composers who use technology to, to give a vision of the future. And then when pandemic came, we really, we were stunned and we like everywhere else, we, we started to do plan A, B, C, D all the way to Z. And then we always felt like something happened for a reason. So it, it almost became a, a per perfect time for us to explore what we always wanted, which is to uh, bring the festival online. Um, but we wanted to bring it with the style of the festival rather than just use technology as a, as a convenience. So we started uh, to program in a very short period of time, thanks to the rich history and all the friendship brought in by, by the worldly Beijing Music Festival ever visited great musicians and artists. So we could pull up a program uh, to have multiple uh, productions, recordings all across the gro uh, globe using Zoom and all sorts of um, online gathering uh, to put up a program of the non-stop 240 hours of music experience on our APP. So it was uh, quite something. It was already a review of the entire history of the festival, but also we managed to bring new work through this uh, platform as well. So there were a lot of interviews. There were a lot of uh, composed events with um, with new uh, 
aspects of music. So we, we managed to bring more world music and also uh, review of our past uh, compositions ever commissioned at the festival in depth with interviews and, uh, and radio programs and, uh, and, and, and uh, video programs. So it was also then a great leap forward about the copyright awareness in our festival that year and you know not our festival but the whole of China to to make to to make aware this industry with such difficulty we we, we are as a leading festival we protect musicians and we we have every way to uh, make sure the musicians are heard loud and clear that uh, copyright uh, globally is uh, is well uh, deserved and 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 uh, needed to be looked at. So uh, that became sort of a, a benchmark for that year. So ever continued, we we started to have online growing online audience. And China is, you know, with with Maestro Long Yu's uh, legacy of the festival to start with, he continued to develop all these orchestras around the world. I mean, we have the one hundred orchestra. Uh, allies, you know, this this organization that had not only uh, their performers uh, constantly appear at our festival in, in the form of marathon and whatever, uh, the music marathon, but also uh, their audience then became our audience. So the, the, the national uh, audience is, the, the number is tremendous. We just had, um, you know, since, since the trial of bringing everything online, we had uh, keep on doing this format. And then this year uh, we had this um, opening, uh, just, just the gala concert for celebrating 25th anniversary. Uh, surprisingly, we had all, almost 900 million audience online live to watch. So that is some, some number in China alone. Uh, so in the future, I'm, I'm, I think we're, you know, we can't escape from thinking about technology. And uh, this would be part of our creative DNA as well to bringing more new generation uh, creators to come together using la music as a language to connect to the rest of the world. Absolutely. Well, tell me, you know, uh, we're sitting here, everyone I know is doing their post COVID agenda now of where they're gonna travel and what they're gonna do and what life will be like when we get back to normal. Um, assuming that we have a full festival open up again next year, what is the balance that you see? What's your ideal balance now between live events and media events, um, inviting people from around the world back to Beijing to actually be in the same room at the same time, experiencing the same events, um, and also uh, local China uh, uh, projects that you're bringing to the stage? What kind of balance do you foresee in the future? I think it will it will be a parallel experience of the live events as well as the uh, online uh, experience, but we will try to make the online experience and uh, technologically uh, initiated music project as far visioned as possible, which we which we kind of did with co-commissions such as uh, Holland Festival doing a VR experience of an opera that's newly written just for the format of the VR experience, for example. So that is to bring awareness of how music can can be a fluid language to uh, connect all culture without barrier and, and use technology to make that uh, even more impressive. Um, but live events, gosh, we, we, we miss it. And we want to connect as soon as possible. And we're working in every guts we can to make sure that we re return with a grand uh, um, festival next year and to have as many of as you back to our festival and just, you know, just to, to have a celebration, you know, this is uh, always going to be, we believe this is always going to be the most important aspect of the classical music, which is to be in the same room and to be in the same uh, thinking wave uh, and in tune with the music and to, to, to be able to speak and to breathe together. So even if we're, approaching technology for some, uh, some, sort of some kind of new vision, the intimacy is still, we want to, we want to uh, bring in as a message rather than the convenience of it all. So I think, um, I think in the future, uh, 
not far next year we will have the world back and we will you know we will reach out to the world so excitingly we are already in plan with um, international in, international institutions and uh, big and small and in every way possible to create uh, a new context for young faces, new concept and new compositional work to premiere all together at our festival. So this is this is time to to wait patiently and expect something great. We really appreciate you joining us uh, this morning, this evening, this morning for you. And I think we have some time. We can open up uh, some questions to the audience. Uh, if we can have the house lights up a little bit so I can I can see people. Um, if we have any questions for any of the panelists or for, I think Shuang is going to stay on screen or available for some questions. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Any questions? Two Pulitzer Prize winners in the same room. Come on, guys. A, a famous father girl on stage. Okay, yeah. I'm going to ask a couple questions. Actually, first, first, thank you so much. And um, I think for some people, they don't know who Joe and Chung is. So, and the the project you just mentioned is really exciting, and I think it refers to. Uh, what was just talked about, which is actually intergenerational. There's something about an older generation speaking to a younger generation, but in a totally new way. So, so I'd actually be really curious to hear from, uh, from you, Du Yun, and also from Joe Long about that idea of, of the generational change and are there new things that, that are arising given the times we're living in? Professor Zhou Wendong is a great uh, asset uh, and uh, mentor to me uh, and uh, our generation. Most composers uh, come to New York, uh, brought by Zhou Wendong, Professor Zhou Wendong. Um, I, I would say that his music is not performed very frequently, but uh, his early writings really inspired me. Uh, when I was a, a undergrad, you know, college student in at the Central Conservatory, John uh, Professor John Nong is the first American Chinese composer to visit uh, China, and uh, gave a, a a series of lectures, and he brought the uh, the twentieth century composers' materials, and introduced the other American composers like George Crum. Uh, uh, and other, um, uh, I, I don't think it is Ali Carter, is it? Um, was it from Juilliard? Uh, there's several composers he introduced uh, to our class. Uh, and he, he brought, uh, you know, when we uh, opened the, the university system, we don't have uh, materials. You know, the, the bookshelves is, is empty, and they still uh, make collections, but, uh, you know, but at, at least we don't have this all 20th century Western music materials. And he, he brought some, uh, sent it to the Central Conservatory. Uh, that's why I really, you know, I al already graduated and work at the uh, Broadcasting Symphony. It's a very stable job, uh, but I thought that, you know, I needed to further studies, especially with the Professor Zhou. So that's why, and also brought the Tan Dun, Chen Yi, my wife, uh, and Brad Sheng from Shanghai Conservatory. Uh, there's uh, another Ge Gan Ru, also a composer, a great composer from Shanghai uh, Conservatory. And uh, his vision, as I mentioned, you know, he hoped our generation to study deeper into the Chinese ancient culture. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, he introduced you know, not only the Chinese culture, but the, the Asian, you know, like Japanese, Korean. Uh, he said, you know, you can't just uh, you know, stay in the one culture, but even the Western, you know, especially I spent time in New York. 
I remember first uh, uh, concert I attended, Professor Joe sent me to uh, Philip Glass, Einstein on beach at the BAM. Um, that, that really shocked me. <laughs> yeah. So Professor Joe always uh, encouraged the young, you know, by the time we still consider our young composers, <laughs> uh, but the right now is uh, the next generation. I think the next generation, uh, they're not really uh, use a lot of Chinese elements. Is that true? Yeah, they have their new vision. You know, I I don't against that. Uh, but President Joe asked us really get deeper into the ancient culture. I think you know when you are getting older, you will you will understand more. Yeah, that that's the. You know, my impression with my mentor, Professor Joe yeah. at Columbia. Yeah, yeah that, that's a, a very good, that, that's really a, a, a father to, you know, son kind of relationship in a way. And now we're looking at the grandfather to grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, what, so, so tell us about your project that you're, yeah, you're and talking about. And then I think that then we are talking about a cultural memory. Right. Like like that's the difference between a memory to, of the mental. You know, I've I've seen so um, the, the concert um, of John and John and and all of your music in middle theater. And and I also personally visited him um, a few years ago. But because I've never studied with him. Joe, to me, and I'm I'm also very, very influenced by him. People don't see it, don't hear it. But I know it, so it doesn't matter um, that because when you when you see this figure and we talk to him, and when I see you, when I when I know like your existence, and I learned so much from your generation, not because I you know we are sitting here, um, and it doesn't matter like on surface what music language you talk about, right? Like I also study Chinese, whatever. <laughs> should not say whatever um <laughs> but you know studying oral, oral tradition is one of my one of my you know fault in my 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 focus really but but speaking of this project i'm also thinking what can we really do as a reform like a new imagination of tribute if we only talk with one lineage to another lineage can there be another um because there's so many people like me who feel they're in debt to artists like joe and joe there is no one like you no there are there are so many people there are so many people like like how i think you know we we, we found each other right this is how this like a project came about and and it's actually through uh, one of the really really cool uh label it was uh, the formerly uh, uh verse china yeah, so it's it's really like it. They they did the whole uh, documentary on uh, Chengdu underground uh, hip hop, for instance. Um, and and we're also looking at like how we're not uh, taking quotations from Chong and Chong, but really like paying tribute and what that might look like to each of the artists. And we don't have that. Uh, you must, we must do this, we must do it. It's not about quotation, it's about, we also study, you know, um, looking at all this, um, the articles he, he wrote and, and, the, and the film that, you know, we have, yeah. So, so this is kind of um, interest that I have is also um, looking at our skill, which is notation, which is, you know, classic, so-called classical music, but what is the cultural memory? Right, like from one artist to another artist, and from one generation to another generation. I'm no longer young. I'm also looking at my future generation artists, and the next future generation artists, like they should have their own um, paying tribute to artists like Joe and Joe. Any other questions? Hello. First, I want to thank you for holding this discussion. It's really helpful. And this question is towards uh, Mrs. Bernstein, that uh, they have done a revival of the West Side Story in a movie version. I wonder how do you think about um, the difference that West Side Story have impact 20 years ago and today? Oh, you're speaking of the, the recent uh, Steven Spielberg film of West Side Story as opposed to the old one 
Yes. From 1962, whenever it was. Um, yes, there are the, the two films are are both marvelous in really different ways. And there are many things about the, the new one, the Spielberg film that that are, are a revelation and and really uh, help you experience the the work of West Side Story in in all sorts of new ways. Um, I loved the film a lot. And I loved the old one. It, the, the, the first one came out when I was a little girl. And so I was completely mesmerized by it. Um, but, you know, the world changes. And there are some people who who didn't like the idea of remaking West Side Story because the first film was so perfect. But it's not perfect. It might have been perfect in some ways for its time. But there are many things about that film that that are dated and that were treated in a much more contemporary way for us uh, today in the new version. So there are a, a million fantastic things about both of the movies, and I think you should all go and see them both. Any other questions? Um, I have this question for Ms. Duyen. Um, I'm wondering, because I feel like a lot of your work is not, not, as you said, on the surface level, necessarily rooted in quote unquote Chinese culture with Western perception. Um, so I'm just wondering, like as a Chinese diaspora artist, um, I feel like people always have expectation. How do you navigate or negotiate with that kind of expectation of Chinese element in your work? versus what you want to present as your project in your art. I pretend I don't understand. <laughs> um, I think I'm also one of those very lucky ones um, that I find like-minded people and who believed my vision at different stages. Rachel is one of them. And we really like throughout the years and and we actually presented um, with Chen Yi and um, the Quan Chu. Actually, I have done Chinese elements <laughs> absolutely a lot. Um, uh, one of my uh, upcoming uh, uh, big project is actually, uh, I, I can tell you now, um, is a concerto with uh, 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 a pipa concerto with woman with with many um, orchestras. So. It's the question is um, how how do I navigate? Of I think as a woman artist, I also think that we have so many baggages, right? People see us with so many baggages, but us artists have even more baggages. That's that's our own personal belief and 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 history and a family and and all that right and then there's culture and then there's society and then there's all these different worlds and i think that's actually very interesting if we could use that as as our um uh point of entry um if we understand that that's actually a freedom but not an imprisonment so if, to me that i just use that as my as my freedom rather than thinking that I have to uh, subscribe to other people's confinement to me. I think we have time for one more question. We still have one more musical uh, piece on the program. So I think one more question and we can move on. So this, this question is, is actually for Ken. Um, I'm wondering, since you have um, experienced the uh, festival for a long period of time, and see its evolution uh, from one particular style to where what it is right now. So, what would you would how would you describe that change? Um, it's been very different because China has been very different, and America has been very different. And early on, uh, I think they people could get away with a lot because no one cared, no one really knew what was going on, and as there was success in, in the festival. People paid much more attention, so things got more difficult. Uh, and if, if Shuang is there, you can correct me if I'm if I'm misspeaking on that. But um, 
uh, they had to compete with themselves, but they also had to think about what was what was what audiences were expecting and what was allowed in China at any particular time. And that has changed quite a bit, sometimes not just from year to year, but within each year. Um, there's a lot that going on that that involved, um, uh, you know, a financial crisis, um, a, a, a many different periods of of. Uh, international tension, uh, health care, or you know, and and, and health issues. Uh, I mean, this is not even the first uh, disease that has that has crippled the festival in a way, because 2003, 2004, SARS was was the first one that got in the way, and it, people were were uh, loath to travel at that point, particularly to China. So it was very difficult to to put together replacement programs for things that fell through at, at more or less the last minute. So. Um, I think arts presenters everywhere have a lot of trouble putting things together. Uh, China in, is is a perpetual challenge on on many different fronts, and having uh, prior success is no guarantee of of future success. So uh, what I've seen is just an increasing level of audience sophistication, as we mentioned. The idea that each year has to build on what has happened before, and what I think is is one of the the um, honorable things that the festival has done is that they have stuck with certain artists and and grown with them and 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 followed them. Uh, Joe Long being an example, uh, having not just one commission but a second one that followed up because the first one went really well. People that get invited, Jamie gets back invited back multiple times. Well, once every ten years, I think you're due for another uh, visit soon. Well, <laughs> but but yes. Um, there, there is a support among certain artists that, that to really grow with them, which uh, I think that um, a lot of other organizations could learn from rather than just commissioning, you know, an artist a year and seeing how that piece goes and then just sending it off into the world and letting it find its own way. I, I guess one of the reasons I asked that question is also because when I was in Beijing doing research in 2003 or 2004, uh, the Central Conservatory student would say that they, they had no exposure to contemporary Chinese composers because it weren't play, right? And so it's remarkable that these feature concerts of, you know, individual com composers were, you know, um, put on from year to year. And that changed the scene, I think, in some ways. And 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 then imagine at the beginning, it was exciting for everybody to see what what was this all about that were famous outside of China, right? <laughs> Finally, they could get to hear them in Beijing. So that, I just wonder, that mission is accomplished in some ways. And it's, now it's moving on to something else maybe? Right. Well, that mission was certainly accomplished. And I think one of the things that um, uh, the festival early on in particular was was interested in was showing people in China what the, you know the, the Chinese people have done abroad and bringing it back in. And, and keeping them aware of that. I have to say, though, having heard many of these performances in, in America and sometimes Europe and back in China, they're sometimes entirely different works. I mean, yes, the notes are the same, but uh, say in Amsterdam, for example, they will understand fully the modernist language with some Chinese sprinkled on top. And what you'll hear the same piece in China where they're not so big on modernism, but they know what the root source material is and it sounds like a traditional piece with extended technique. And so they, they can be entirely different experiences from the same piece on paper. Then I think we can move on to our next bit in the evening. Hello again. Uh, so it's my pleasure um, to introduce the second piece of the evening. Um, this piece is called Rhyme and it's written for cello solo. So, um, you know, as a composer, I'm fascinated by uh, just sounds. And one of those sounds are languages. Um, and uh, within the language, rhyme is always very fascinating to me because, you know, uh, we use um, repetition of words. We would change certain pitches of certain words to make a point. We, we make a cadence at the end of the sentence, trying to uh, deliver, deliver a message. And when you think about music, the universal language of it all, it's the same, right? In the music, we do the same. We, um, we, we, we stretch certain notes just a little bit longer to make a point. We, we change interpretations just like how we say the language. So I thought it would be a nice challenge to write a piece 
um, to sort of bridge the two um, rhymes, the musical rhyme and the language rhyme. And I could not think of a better instrument than the cello solo to do that because cello is such a capable instrument, uh, capable of wild colors and amazing techniques. But at the same time, it's perhaps the most um, closest instrument to human voice. So uh, in this piece, you, you will hear three movements. The first movement um, is uh, a rather dramatic opening. The second movement is a meditative um, largo. And the last movement is a playful and a rhythmic finale. It will be my pleasure and honor to welcome back uh, Rachel Henderson of Fraggle for this performance. I hope you enjoy. Thank you very much.